Good evening. Could I have your attention, please? Good evening. Hello. My name is Billy Weitzer, and I'd like to welcome you to the Center for Jewish History. On behalf of the Leo Beck Institute, I am pleased to present the fourth in our series, German Jewish History in the Now, which is about the contemporary relevance of German Jewish history. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, our board member, actually Vice President Michael Bamberger is here, and also our President Emeritus, um, Rabbi Ismar Shorsh, and I'm very pleased to have them. Um, my only other job tonight is to call upon David Myers, who's the President and CEO of the Center for Jewish History. We at LBI are thrilled that David has come to lead this enterprise. He has quickly brought both vision and action that brings, is bringing the partners together and to create a true Center for Jewish History. And with that, I'd like to call on David. Thank you very much, Billy. Um, I, we all know that your view is unanimous, unanimously shared by members of the larger New York community. Um, I'm really delighted to, to be here to welcome you to this uh, really wonderful and stimulating event. Um, the center, as some of you may know, is really a remarkable institution. It is probably the world's leading repository of Jewish archival sources a place where great scholarship is produced every single day, um, a place with unparalleled archival collections. And this is just one of the many reasons why the center is such an extraordinary place. Uh, another one that really, I think, relates to our proceedings this evening is the fact that the center is deeply committed to bringing historical knowledge and perspective to ever wider audiences, based on the belief that more historical knowledge, more historical perspective, more historical analysis enrich and inform civic engagement and wise public policy. And we think that Jewish history has much to teach us, much to teach us about how we have arrived at the moment we have uh, in the present. Um, and this is, in a certain sense, the ultimate payoff of historical research to help us understand who we are and how we got to where we stand at present. One of the other great virtues of this place, and indeed the very soul of it, are the constituent partners of whom the Leo Beck Institute is uh, one of five and a very distinguished partner at that. Um, I have to just uh, express my own deep sense of appreciation to the staff of the Leo Beck Institute, uh, which excels in everything that it does, and um, express at the same time my deep appreciation to, Bill, to Billy Weitzer for his uh, really wonderful, able leadership uh, of this venerable institution that manages to find new ways to assure its relevance. Um, the most recent piece of evidence, of course, is the extraordinary project uh, series of events that we are in the midst of, uh, German Jewish history in the now, reflects back to that second characteristic or goal of the Center for Jewish History to bring historical perspective to the present, to better inform us about who we are uh, and how we got where we are. Um, the events that have preceded have been diverse and stimulating, those that follow the same. Uh, tonight, we turn our attention to Moses Mendelssohn, arguably the most important German-Jewish intellectual figure and thinker, a person who was known by historians after his time as the first modern Jew, a designation that has been shared by many, I should note. Um, but Mendelssohn, who was born in 1729 uh, and died in 1786, was renowned for his innovative uh, and important contributions to um, thinking anew about the nature of the relationship between church and state, the very idea of Judaism, uh, the importance of embracing secular studies as a regular part of one's intellectual formation. I would say he also embodied an animating tension that relates to the very core of the modern Jewish condition, which is 
exemplified in his personal example. He lived a fully observant life, um, steadfast in its adherence to rabbinic Judaism, and at the same time developed a very interesting voluntaristic notion of religion and Judaism based on the belief that no one should be coerced to think or even practice a certain way. Um, and that tension uh, was one that was very difficult even for Mendelssohn's own children to hold on to. Um, and in a certain way, that tension inaugurates the modern era of Jewish history. Um, there are, of course, many other defining moments, but that's a very important one and one that uh, remains with us to the today. Um, we are uh, privileged to have three distinguished scholars uh, with us who are going to help illuminate the legacy of Moses Mendelssohn and reflect with us on what is important about him today. I'm going to introduce them all very briefly, um, and then I'll lay out the uh, design of the evening um, and then hand it off to them. Um, I should say, and this is relevant uh, to the entire proceedings and especially relevant to one of our speakers, that uh, this event, which is sponsored by the Leo Beck Institute um, and delightfully supported by the Center for Jewish History, is co-sponsored by the Jewish Review of Books, which is, as many of you know, one of the leading intellectual forums for serious thought and conversation in the Jewish world. Um, and we're delighted to have uh, its founding editor, Abe Socher, with us. Uh, Abe is a professor of Jewish studies at Oberlin University. Um, he also is the animating force behind the Jewish Review of Books, and he is going to moderate the discussion that will follow presentations by uh, two of his colleagues, uh, both of whom are experts in German Jewish thought. Uh, the first of whom is Micha Gottlieb, who is an associate professor of Hebrew and Judaic studies at New York University, and the author of the important book, Faith and Freedom, Moses Mendelssohn's Theological Political Thought. Um, I'm delighted to report that Micha is also the co-editor with Charles Manneken of a new volume uh, entitled Moses Mendelssohn, Enlightenment, Religion, Politics, Nationalism, um, which I encourage you all to purchase, um, uh, University Press of Maryland. Um, and then our, our third participant um, is, in a certain sense, the dean of studies in German Jewish intellectual history, if I may say, David. I'm sorry to cast that designation on you. It has nothing to do with your age. Um, it is entirely a function of your, uh, of your scholarly distinction. Uh, David Sorkin, who is the Lucy Moses Professor of Jewish History in the Department of History at Yale University, author of uh, uh, many um, important uh, studies of German Jewish thought, beginning with his really canonical first book entitled The Transformation of German Jewry um, from 1987, which he followed up uh, with uh, with a volume devoted to Moses Mendelssohn and the religious, religious enlightenment, and that's just the beginning of a very long series of publications, including books that I'm not going to mention. Um, all three of our speakers are original, incisive, and uh, important uh, chroniclers of German Jewish intellectual history, uh, and Moses Mendelssohn in particular. And uh, we are going to hear at first from Micha Gottlieb for a brief presentation then David Sorkin, um, and after that, uh, Abe Socher will uh, moderate a discussion uh, um, between our panelists and uh, involving you at some point. Uh, it's, again, a great pleasure to be here. I look forward to a very stimulating evening, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, David, for that wonderful introduction. Um, Moses Mendelssohn was really a trailblazer. Uh, he played a pivotal role in the emergence of modern Judaism. A leading figure of the Jewish Enlightenment, or the Haskalah. In his own day, Mendelssohn was one of the most famous Enlightenment philosophers throughout Europe. And he's also been seen as the first modern Jewish philosopher, and as David mentioned, even the first modern Jew. But when you look at the reception 
of Moses Mendelssohn, especially over the latter part of the 19th century and into the 20th century, he was often regarded more as someone whose significance belonged to the past rather than to the present or the future. Already with Hegel in the beginning of the 19th century, philosophers charged that Moses Mendelssohn's philosophy was superficial, unoriginal. Marxists rejected his commitment to capitalism as out of date, flying in the face of the truths of historical materialism. Zionism, Zionists, many Zionists criticized Mendelssohn, believing that he had exchanged a robust sense of Jewish nationalism for an illusionary, an illusory dream of assimilation. And this claim was made in the 19th century and then was seen to have been definitively proven after the Holocaust by many Zionists. Many Orthodox Jews, on the other hand, saw Mendelssohn as the father of secularism and reform. For their part, secular Jews often thought that Moses Mendelssohn's belief in religion and religious principles made him too religious, while reform Jews thought that many reform Jews thought that his commitment to halakha made him too orthodox. For many conservative Jews, Mendelssohn was insufficiently attuned to historical change. He lacked a robust sense of historical development. While renewal Jews thought that Mendelssohn's Judaism was too coldly rational and inattentive to religious, personal religious experience. But something interesting has happened, which is that while Mendelssohn was a very important figure in the 19th century, and then kind of fell out of fashion, especially at the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, suddenly, in the 21st century, Mendelssohn seems to be, to many people, relevant again. And there are a plethora of academic studies, you know, tens of books, articles, and translations of Mendelssohn's works that have been coming out mostly in the last 20 years. And that's really remarkable. And this book, which I edited with Chip Manikin, was uh, born of a sense that there's something very important that Mendelssohn has to tell us about this particular moment in history. And this volume gathers many of the leading Mendelssohn scholars uh, to think about questions of contemporary relevance like religion, politics, um, and nationalism. Well, why is Mendelssohn relevant today? Part of it has to do with the world in which Mendelssohn came into uh, maturity. Yeah. Mendelssohn's age was an age of radical change. He was living in a world that was going, undergoing enormous upheaval. Principles of the Enlightenment were transforming the social, political, and religious spheres. Ideals of universal reason were challenging entrenched dogmas of Christianity, while ideals of equality and tolerance we're calling into question long-established social and economic privileges for European Christians. Now, Judaism clearly had much to gain from these Enlightenment principles. Dethroning the supremacy of Christian belief opened the door to Judaism being deemed a religious confession equal to Protestantism and Catholicism. Equality and tolerance opened the possibility of Jews being granted civil rights and entering economic professions that had previously excluded them. But, not surprisingly, many German Protestants felt deep anxiety about these developments, about this changing world. And many of them reacted by blaming Jews for these changes. It was very common for many German Christians and Protestants to stereotype Jews as beggars, shysters, or thieves. Protestants, it was argued that if Jews were granted more equal rights, more rights, that would increase crime and impoverish society. As Jews sought to enter more professions, many Protestants worried that Jews would steal their jobs. And they argued that the government must act to protect them, to protect Christians. Jews were also commonly 
accused of sowing social division and disorder, chaos. It was often claimed that Jews regarded themselves as superior to Christians. They secretly maintained a very hateful attitude towards Christians. They did not regard the countries in which they lived as their homelands. And they felt free to disregard the local laws if it was in their interest and they thought they could get away with it. For many German Protestants, the fact that Jews seemed to commit and stated that many Jews were committing to liberal enlightenment was itself a cynical ploy that was used simply to advance their own economic interests. And one could see, it was argued, that the Jews weren't really committed to enlightenment principles because of their fanatical loyalty to their rabbis, the disdain for secular learning, and their belief in the legitimacy of using political power, such as excommunication, to enforce halachic law. As a result, many Protestants argued that Jews had no place in a modern enlightened polity. Indeed, some conclude that the only way that Jews could attain equal rights was by abandoning Judaism and becoming Christians. Others thought that even this would not suffice. Judaism was so penetrated the veins of Jews, it was so in their blood, that they could never be accepted as equals. How did Mendelssohn? Mendelssohn stepped into this, this, this environment, and he sought to meet these challenges. And I would argue that he adopted a three-prong approach that is very worth considering in our own day. First, Mendelssohn believed that it was important to enact internal changes within German Judaism. He recognized that the critics of Judaism were not entirely wrong. Many Germans, German Jews were highly suspicious of secular knowledge. Many did maintain superstitious beliefs. Many believed that the rabbi should have the power to excommunicate and harbored hateful attitudes towards Christians. Some Jews were involved in crime and felt that it was legitimate to defraud Christians. Mendelssohn taught that this was a defacing of true Judaism, that true Judaism was fully compatible with enlightened cosmopolitan ideals. As evidence of this, Mendelssohn noted that unlike Protestantism, Judaism did not demand belief in irrational dogmas of faith. And the Talmud, he argued, was a book committed to logical reasoning. Judaism was more tolerant than Protestantism, affirming that one need not be Jewish to go to heaven. Halacha commanded Jews to be loyal to the countries in which they resided, to obey its laws, and to regard their fellow non-Jewish inhabitants as brothers and sisters. And this was not just a set of theoretical, philosophical beliefs from Mendelssohn. He sought to take practical action to change the way Judaism was perceived by Jews by reforming Jewish education. So that's the first element, which was an internal, a sense that there's need for some internal change in the community. Second, Mendelssohn sought to define what it meant to be German. In the 18th century, there was actually no accepted definition of what it meant to be German. Germany was divided into all sorts of, there was no Germany, there were just different polities, German states, and there was a lot of people debated and had questions about what does it really mean to be German. For Mendelssohn, being German clearly was not a question of blood or religion. There were Catholic and Protestant Germans, and Prussia, the German state in which Mendelssohn resided, had welcomed immigrants of different religions from different lands. For Mendelssohn, he argued that German culture must be defined by what the German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz had called the grand manner of philosophizing. And Leibniz, who lived before Mendelssohn, um, had argued that truth could only be attained by welcoming many different perspectives, by looking for different sources of truth and finding the truth in each individual perspective. And Mendelssohn's commitment to this to this principle is evident in his lifelong commitment to the process of translation. Mendelssohn is very well known for his translation of the Bible into, uh, into German, which was the first Ger German Jewish Bible translation. But 
he's less known, it's less known, that he also introduced Plato into German discourse, translating him from Greek into German. He translated Jean-Jacques Rousseau from French into German, and the important English philosopher Lord Shaftesbury into English, from English into German. So he was translating, constantly involved in a process of translation because he believed this was critical for society to move forward, to be vital, revitalized for progress. So that's the second principle. He sought to define German identity. The third principle, and the third thing that Mendelssohn did, was that he believed and argued very strongly that Judaism was of a value not just for Jews, but for German society as a whole. For Mendelssohn, Judaism provided a model for marrying rational enlightenment philosophy with religious faith. The foundation of Judaism was love, whose goal was to, per to perfect a person's mind and ethical character. Judaism was a tolerant religion, which found value in multiple religious expressions. Mendelssohn saw Judaism's principles as helping temper religious division and as providing a foundation for social cohesion. For this reason, he believed that being a good Jew was not just or even primarily about benefiting the Jewish people, but rather about benefiting German society as a whole. And this was how he understood the prophet Isaiah's injunction to the Jews to be a light into the nations. The anxieties that many German Protestants felt in the 18th century seem strikingly similar to the anxiety that many white Americans and Europeans feel, feel today. Now, and then, now as then, there is resentment about foreigners stealing, our, stealing one's jobs, impoverishing the country, bringing crime, sowing social disorder, and being insufficiently patriotic. And as in the 18th century, there is a temptation to long for an idyllic, imagined past when society was supposedly more homogeneous, peaceful, and prosperous. Mendelssohn understood that such views were toxic fantasies and would lead society to become more violent, bigoted, and poor. And he saw in enlightened cosmopolitanism a model for looking forward rather than backwards. His key insight was that implementing, implementing enlightened cosmopolitanism required reforms and adjustments on all sides. Majorities who felt dispossessed must learn that hatred and outrage were not signs of moral courage and strength. Rather, they were signs of fear and weakness. And this is what Mendelssohn wrote in his 1783 masterpiece, Jerusalem. Quote, it requires some reflection if we are to comprehend that hatred and vindictiveness, envy and cruelty are at bottom nothing but weakness and merely the effects of fear. For Mendelssohn, welcoming the stranger and allowing her to preserve religious and cultural difference was not just a question of moral duty, but also of enlightened self-interest, since it was a way of vitalizing a country's economy and culture by injecting fresh ideas and energy. So that's on the part of majorities. For, the, for their part, minorities should strive to value humanistic learning, cherish the countries they live in, learn the local language, and regard all the country's citizens as their brothers and sisters while remaining faithful to their own religion. And as Mendelssohn put it, adapt yourselves to the morals and constitution of the land to which you have been removed, but hold fast to the religion of your fathers. Bear both burdens as well as you can. So at a time of much social anxiety in 21st century America, I believe that we can still learn much from the profound insights of a great German Jewish philosopher of the 18th century. I look forward to David uh, Sorkin's comments and to the conversation. And just before I turn it over to David, I just want to mention a few thank yous. Um, and that first I want to thank Chip Manikin, who is the co-editor of this volume, which was originally first the occasion for thinking about putting together this event. I uh, want to thank David Myers, the new head of the CJH, for, introduction, for introducing the program and supporting the program. And I want to say that the CJH is enormously lucky to have a scholar of David's caliber leading it. And we're all very grateful and very excited for, for the next upcoming few years. And from Leo Beck, I want to thank Billy Weitzer, the executive director, for his support, Frank Mecklenburg, the director of research and the chief, chief archi archivist, for the active role he took in this program, 
David Brown, the Communications and Program Director, um, for helping organize the event. And finally, to thank Abe and David for agreeing to come and participate. So, I'll turn it over to David. Um, thank, um, good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you, Micha, for um, all of those acknowledgements which I um, um, uh, won't recapitulate, but certainly agree with. Thank you. Um, I'd like to talk about Moses Mendelssohn's relevance today, and I'd like to do so by suggesting that the very characteristics which made him the most formative figure for Judaism in the 19th century make him a relevant figure today. Um, now, David Myers called me the Dean of German Jewish Studies, which makes me a bit uncomfortable because I want to talk about the person I consider to be the Dean of Mendelssohn Studies, which is Alexander Alt, the late Alexander Altman. Um, in 1983, at a conference which uh, I had the pleasure to attend, and Ismar Shorsh was also there and gave a wonderful paper, uh, Alexander Altman gave a fabulous paper on Moses Mendelssohn as the archetypal German Jew in which he argued that Mendelssohn had been the patron saint of German Jewry. And he singled out four characteristics which had, made, had given Mendelssohn that prominent position. First, acculturation, his masterful adoption of German language and culture, including his friendship with Gotthold of Ryan Lessing. Second, that he was a Jew by conviction not just by birth. Third, that he was the first philosopher of Judaism in modern times. And finally, and, and particularly in his defense of the commandments of the mitzvot. And finally, that he was an, an unflagging advocate for the Jews' civil rights or emancipation. Now, whereas Micha um, emphasized Mendelssohn's critics in the 19th century, I'm going to emphasize, emphasize his admirers. Because one could say that because of those four characteristics, Mendelssohn was in fact the most formative figure, indeed the patron saint of all the various forms of German Judaism which emerged in the 19th century. Reformed Jews could hold on to Mendelssohn's emphasis on morality and reason in Judaism. And that became then the core of the notion, Geiger's notion of prophetic Judaism, for example. Conservative Jews in the 19th century, known as positive historical Jews, could admire Mendelssohn's very deft effort to balance between reason and the commandments. And orthodox Jews, could emphasize Mendelssohn's own observance and the fact that Mendelssohn identified the commandments, observance of the commandments, the mitzvot, with morality for Judaism. So all of the various forms of Judaism, and the, what we today see as the streams of Judaism or the denominations, emerged in Germany in the 19th century, and all of them could claim Mendelssohn as their patron saint or father. In addition, it shouldn't be forgotten, that Mendelssohn was also the author of one of the best-selling Hebrew books of the 19th century. His translation of the Bible and commentary uh, went through at least two dozen editions in the 19th century. And those editions, those weren't put out by academic presses, those were put out by commercial presses because the publishers knew that they would be lucrative. Now, what's important to see is, is that those books also transformed Mendelssohn's project. Because the first edition of Mendelssohn's Bible, uh, the Book of the Paths of Peace, Sefer Nitivot Shalom, only had a few pieces. It had the biblical text in Hebrew, of course. It has met, had Mendelssohn's translation into German, though, and I can't emphasize strongly enough, 
printed in Hebrew letters, German in Hebrew letters, and then Mendelssohn's commentary in Hebrew as well. Subsequent editions turned Mendelssohn's Bible into the study Bible of the 19th century. What was added to it? Rashi's commentary, the source for teaching the Bible to children and the source of the, the, the most accessible and vivid source of rabbinic commentary. The Aramaic translation of Uncleus was added, which is considered to be uh, authoritative by the rabbis. Many editions carried the Sabbath liturgy and the Haftorah portions so that it could be used for liturg study and liturgical purposes. So Mendelssohn's Bible became the study Bible of the 19th century um, and one of the best-selling Hebrew books. Now, how do these characteristics, which I've mentioned that Altman identified, the four characteristics of acculturation, of Jew by conviction, the first philosopher of Judaism in modern times, and an advocate of civil rights or emancipation, translate into relevance in the 21st century? Let me just give you a few examples. First, on the reconciliation of belief and philosophy, uh, I'd like to discuss, briefly discuss uh, a wonderful revealing piece by the philosopher Martha Nussbaum, who teaches at the University of Chicago, is a very well-known political philosopher, philosopher of, and student of classical uh, philosophy, published an article um, about her conversion to Judaism, which she called Judaism and the Love of Reason. And in the first sentence of that article, she says, I am an Enlightenment Jew. Now, what does she mean by that? What she means by that is, is that she converted to a Judaism as she understood it, understood it, quote, committed to the primacy of the moral, the authority of truth and reason, and the equal worth of all human beings. And she has a couple of quotations at the beginning of the article. Who do they come from? Moses Mendelssohn. I quote, the highest stage of wisdom is incontrovertibly doing that which is good. Moses Mendelssohn, 1777. Or a, a, a famous slogan of Mendelssohn's, love truth, love peace, 1783. Now, she also says that the that the Orthodox rabbi who converted her, in her eyes, was a Mendelssohnian, even though he didn't know it. She says he believed in the priority of the practical, and he understood the biblical revelation as legislation that demanded performance, rather than as metaphysical dogma. And then she quotes Mendelssohn. I quote, among all the prescriptions and ordinances of the Mosaic law, there is not a single one which says, you shall believe or not believe. They all say, you shall do or not do. Faith is not commanded, for it accepts no other commands than those that come to it by way of conviction. All the commandments of the divine law are addressed to man's will, to his power to act. Now, the second example I'd like to, to cite uh, is one which uh, one of my sons brought to my attention. Uh, it's an article that appeared in the New York Times, in the International New York Times, by one Mustafa Aikyol called Sharia's Winding Path into Modernity. It appeared on, in July 4th, 2017. The question that the author raises is, how does one reconcile Islamic law, Sharia, and religious liberty? How do you reconcile a religion based in law with a liberal society governed by civil law? And what's his answer? 
He says what we need to look at is, quote, the Jewish Enlightenment. Its proponents, here I quote, like the 18th century philosopher Moses Mendelssohn, reinterpreted Judaism in the light of modern values like secular knowledge, rationality, and, the, and freedom of conscience. The arguments Mendelssohn articulated in his 1783 masterpiece, Jerusalem, are remarkably similar to the arguments by Muslim reformists today. In other words, the Jewish Enlightenment, not Martin Luther's Protestant Reformation, is the right analogy for the reform needed in contemporary Islam. A third example, um, and this is uh, 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 the third issue, is that of immigration and refugees. Micha raised this already. Um, Mendelssohn, because of his intellectual prominence in the 18th century, uh, was asked at different times by various Jewish communities to intercede on their behalf when they were having difficulties with the authorities. One example of that was the community of Dresden, which was about to be expelled because its charter had expired. And here's what Mendelssohn wrote about expulsion. And I think, though this was about Jews, it applies to any refugee or immigrant today. Expulsion is for a Jew the harshest punishment. More than mere banishment, it is virtual extirpation from God's earth, for prejudice turns him away at every border with an iron fist. Must fellow human beings who are free of guilt and trespass suffer this harshest of punishments simply because they adhere to different principles of belief and through misfortune are reduced to poverty. Finally, the last issue I'd like to address uh, is that of individual freedom. Uh, and Micha already mentioned this, that Mendelssohn was an advocate of a, of a form of radical individualism and of the reduction of religious authority. He rejected coercion of any kind in any religion. He saw religion as necessarily being a voluntary society in which any member, anyone who wants to participate or belong should be allowed to do, to do so. Let me just read you a quotation from Mendelssohn. The purpose of an ecclesiastical society, a church or a synagogue, is collective edification, participation in the effusion of the heart, through which we acknowledge our gratitude for God's benefactions and our filial trust in his infinite beneficence. In what spirit would we want to deny entrance to the dissident, nonconformist, errant or recusant to refuse the freedom to partake of this edification. Reason's house of devotion requires no locked doors. And then in addition he says, the true divine religion arrogates to itself no authority over opinion, opinions and judgments, recognizes no power other than the power of argument to convince and to persuade and through conviction to bestow felicity. The true divine religion has no recourse, has recourse to neither arms nor fingers. It is pure spirit and heart. Thank you. Well, you've given us a lot to think about. Um, so you've both made arguments, um, complementary arguments for Mendelssohn's present day 21st century relevance. But before we get to that, um, I mean, Mendelssohn was an extraordinary human figure. He had an extraordinary life. Um, he, was, uh, he was called both, I think, uh, the Socrates of Berlin and also uh, the improbably circumcised philosopher. Um, and, and so this extraordinary Jewish life, um, we, should, we should evoke uh, be, before we move to the 
to the more abstract issues, I think. You've given us, David, a, a wonderful picture uh, or um, sense of Mendelssohn's own words, and he was a great, elegant writer. But maybe you could just give us a sketch of his life, and we'll pick up from there. Okay. Um, well, let me pick up from um, what Abe said. Uh, the way I think about Mendelssohn. Thank you, Abe. Can everyone hear now? OK. Uh, the, the way I think of Mendelssohn is um, I think of the two faces of Moses Mendelssohn. Uh, one is Moses Mendelssohn, the German philosopher, who was known as the Socrates of Berlin. The other is Moses Mendelssohn, the Jewish writer writing in Hebrew, who was known as Moses Dessau, Moshe Mi Dessau and about whom it was said, from Moses unto Moses, there was none like Moses. From the biblical Moses to Maimonides to Mendelssohn. Uh, let, let me just give you a brief account of the two faces of Mendelssohn. Uh, let me begin with um, Moses of Dessau, Moshe Mi Dessau, uh, the Hebrew writer and Jewish thinker. Uh, Mendelssohn was born in 1729 in Dessau to a um, learned but impoverished Jewish family. His father was a scribe. He had a traditional cheder education until the age of 13, until his uh, bar mitzvah, uh, with a very learned rabbi, uh, who then was called to a more prestigious post in Berlin. And Mendelssohn followed his rabbi, David Frankel, to Berlin, where he became a student uh, at um, Berlin's yeshiva, which was known as the yeshiva of 40 students because it supposedly had fellowships or support for 40 students. Um, what that support meant was is that you got, you took meals with wealthy families in Berlin, you would pray at uh, local, at private synagogues for um, a, a small uh, remuneration. Uh, Mendelssohn wrote that in those years, early years in Berlin, uh, he often had a loaf of bread to eat for the entire week, and he would make marks in the bread so he would know how much he could eat each day. Um, while, at, while at the yeshiva, uh, he studied uh, Talmud and other Jewish texts um, uh, vigorously. Um, as, as, a, as, a young man, as, a, as a youngster in Dessau, he had already gone beyond what was then the standard curriculum of Talmud and Kabbalah, and had started studying the Bible on his own, memorizing Psalms, writing poetry in Hebrew, uh, and he continued those sort of, in, in those activities. Uh, he then wrote in Hebrew continuously throughout his life, which is something that's often neglected. Uh, in the late 1750s, he published the first modern journal in Hebrew. It only came out in two issues, but nonetheless. In 1760, he published a commentary um, on um, a philosophical primer of uh, Moses Maimonides from the 12th century, which he updated for contemporary use. In 1770, uh, a commentary on the book of Ecclesiastes, which gave him the occasion to discuss philosophical issues uh, in, an in an exit through, exege through exegesis. Uh, and then in 1783, um, his Bible translation, which was really his magnum opus, uh, which, which I mentioned and which then became the best-selling Hebrew book of the, one of the best-selling Hebrew books of the 19th century. So much for Moses Dessa. Now the Socrates of Berlin. While Mendelssohn was in Berlin studying at the yeshiva, he also began secular studies. Uh, there were a number of people who tutored him at the time, Jewish intellectuals from Eastern Europe, who introduced him to medieval Jewish philosophy uh, and uh, commenting on med medieval Jewish philosophy. He also began to study languages. Uh, in those days, you didn't go to Berlin in order to study language or even pick up a dictionary. He would read the Bible in Hebrew and read the Bible in the other language in order to teach himself that language. 
Uh, he taught himself English, French, and of course German and became a master of German prose and also Greek and Latin. Uh, he published his first book in 1754, The Philosophical Dialogues, uh, which is a wonderful story. Uh, he had become very good friends with Guthold of Rheim Lessing, one of Germany's great men of letters in the late 18th century. They played chess together. Uh, and Mendelssohn wrote a book and one day gave it to Lessing, wrote a manuscript and wrote it to Lessing and said, well, would you have a look at this and tell me what you think and you know, if, let me know if the German is any good and what I should do with it. And they kept playing chess, meeting regularly, time passed. And after a few months, Mendelssohn said to Lessing, well, have you had a chance to look at my manuscript? And Lessing reached into his briefcase and pulled out a published book and said, here it is. And so that was Mendelssohn's first publication. He continued to publish regularly. Uh, his books were well known. But what, one of the things that helped to make his reputation is that he was also a consummate reviewer of books. He wrote for a journal that was published by a good friend of his, Friedrich Nikolai, Lessing, Nikolai, and Mendelssohn were sort of a triumvirate. And basically, it was the equivalent of the New York Review of Books, not the Jewish Review of Books, of his day. And he wrote over, I think, between 80 and 100 reviews. And this gave him a reputation throughout German-speaking Europe. There were two other things that made his reputation. In 1763, the, the Royal Berlin Academy of Sciences had an essay contest. Mendelssohn wrote a philosophical treatise called uh, Treatise on Certainty in Metaphysical Philosophy, and he won first place in that essay contest. Immanuel Kant, have ever, any of you heard of Immanuel Kant? Kant won second place. In 17, then in 1767, um, as Micha said, Mendelssohn translated works from various languages, Rousseau from French, Shaftesbury from English, Plato from Greek. He translated Plato's dialogue, the, the Phaedon on the Immortality of the Soul, in which he also rewrote. And that book became an international bestseller, and it turned Mendelssohn into the Socrates of Berlin. To the point where Mendelssohn uh, was on the intellectual tourist circuit. You know, if you were a young gentleman from England or from France or from Italy making the grand tour as part of your education and you went to Prussia and you came to Berlin, one of the places you had to go was to meet Moses Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn kept an open salon at his home in the late afternoon and people also came to visit him at, at, the, at the silk factory which of which he, of which he was at first a bookkeeper, eventually became uh, uh, a manager and ultimately a co-owner. Um, so he was both then, he had these two faces, Moses of Dessau and the Socrates of Berlin. So, um, let's see. Let's pick up on it this way. So, Micha, you've argued for Mendelssohn's contemporary relevance. David's just sketched his, his biography. Is there a particular moment in that biography, whether, whether David has mentioned it or not, that um, exemplifies his present-day relevance, the way in which he could speak to us, be a usable figure? Well, I wanted to mention uh, an event that uh, David didn't get to. Um, which is um, famous controversy that he had. And he, um, he had many controversies in his life. Uh, people have this image of Mendelssohn as this very mild-mannered um, person. And he was, although he, had, he, wrote in, he, he wrote in certain places that actually that was not his personality, that actually he actually had a very fiery temperament and he had to control it and he found a way to really be in control of himself and he was, uh, was very self-possessed. Um, but there's a, uh, you know, he, we, when he wrote this 
fight on. And I'd also add to, to David's um, wonderful summary that actually Mendelssohn was the person who, in many ways, introduced Plato into Germany. Um, and he, you know, his, 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 um, his work, The Phaidon, was, was very significant in reviving interest in Plato um, in, in, in Prussia, um, in German-speaking lands. So, um, but in, but he, so he wrote this work, and this work was, as was mentioned, an international bestseller, went into four editions in his lifetime, was translated into five languages. He was getting invitation to all sorts of royal courts, and um, you know this, this this work was a defense of the immortality of the soul. And one person who read this was um, the Swiss deacon by the name of Johann Kasper Lavater. And Lavater was a great admirer of Moses Mendelssohn and um, was familiar with his works. And Lavater, though, had a um, he was on the one hand an admirer of philosophy and someone who kind of kept up with Enlightenment um, thought and in some sense identified with it. But then he had this other side of himself where he was this kind of mystic and he had these millenarian messianic fantasies. And this was something which was, these two things going together was not necessarily something so unusual in the 18th century. If you think about someone like Newton who is on the one hand discovering uh, modern physics, the principles of modern physics, but had spent much of his time writing commentaries on biblical prophecies. So this was not necessarily um, unusual for the time. But Lafater, he was operating with some of the stereotypes that I had mentioned before. And he assumes that a person who is rational and a person who is ethical, by definition, must be a Christian. A person who was irrational, right, shuns secular knowledge, who could have the stupidity not to realize that the New Testament was the fulfillment of the Old Testament um, and was unethical um, and immoral, that was a Jew. So he looked at Moses Mendelssohn and he was very confused. On the one hand, this is a highly rational, intellectual, moral person and we, he's but and highly ethical. Mendelssohn was very well known for being extremely ethical. Um, on the other hand, he's an active member of the Jewish community publicly. He he's clearly identifies as a Jew, um, and he's someone who is giving sermons in the uh, great synagogue in, um, in in Berlin. Was friends with the chief rabbi and so forth. So the, he's kind of had a brain freeze about this. It kind of really. Um, he, he didn't know what to do with this Lafater. So he came to the conclusion that this, this, you can't have a logical contradiction. So the conclusion must be not that his stereotypes are wrong, but that Mendelssohn was um, secretly a Christian at heart, and that he was doing these things just to protect himself, and he didn't really believe in Judaism. So Lafater then decided that he was, but he, he wanted to call Mendelssohn out, because he thought Mendelssohn is so respected by the Jewish community that if he's um, that if he would actually confess his true belief in Jesus and in Christianity, he would inspire all these different, all these Jews, so many Jews to convert to Christianity, and this would kind of spread like a wildfire and would pre precipitate the second coming of Christ. So there were quite um, serious consequences to this in his mind. So he hit upon this idea. He had read this book by um, a Swiss physician, uh, physiologist, scientist, Charles Bonnet, who was very well respected, who had written a defense of Christianity, a philosophical defense of Christianity. And what Lafater did was he decided to translate part of it and to dedicate it to Mendelssohn. And what he, he, he dedicated it in a very interesting way. He dedicated to what he called, to Mendelssohn, who he called an Israelite in whom there is no guile. Um, guile, deceit, no deceit. And, um, and he said that, he sh that Mendelssohn should consider these arguments by, um, by Bonnet and refute them if he could. And if he could not, he should, quote, do what prudence, love of truth, and honesty command you to do, what Socrates would have done had he read this work and found it irrefutable. In other words, he's saying, if you find these defenses of Christianity to be irrefutable, you should refer to Christianity. And this calling Mendelssohn an Israelite in whom there is no deceit 
was very important because it's actually a reference to the New Testament, to the first chapter of John, where um, Jesus encounters someone named Nathaniel, an Israelite, and he calls Nathaniel an Israelite in whom there is no guile, um, an honest Israelite. Well, how could that be? Well, the answer is Nathaniel then proceeds to um, call Jesus the Son of God and admit that Jesus is the Son of God. So he expected Mendelssohn to follow in this, uh, in this path. And so this put Mendelssohn in really an impossible situation because on the one hand, he was just a tolerated Jew. I mean, Mendelssohn was not a citizen. Almost no Jews were citizens. Only the most, most wealthy could be citizens. He was a tolerated Jew. And um, he, his position was very precarious and it was very problematic for him to challenge the prevailing religious uh, system of uh, Protestantism. Um, so he really didn't know what to do because on the one hand he couldn't really attack Christianity publicly and explain why he thought these arguments were no good, but on the other hand if he said nothing that would be taken as evidence that he really agreed with these arguments and that Christianity was the true religion. So he kind of debated this for a couple of months and then he hit upon a truly brilliant solution and he wrote this essay called, which was, came to be known as the Open Letter to Fater. And this is one of his most amazing works. And this was a work which really, in some ways, was very difficult for him because it shocked him. David has mentioned that he was active in the Jewish community writing Hebrew works, writing German philosophical works. But in his German philosophical works and his Jewish works were almost two separate worlds. They didn't really interact with each other. He never had to explain his commitment in German, uh, his commitment to Judaism, to a German Protestant audience. He felt it wasn't necessary. He thought, we're beyond that. You know, we're tolerant, enlightened people. And he realized with Lafater that that was not true. So he had to do this. But how to do this? So his solution was, um, he really had kind of three parts in the essay. First, he was extremely honest. He said, look, you've put me, Lafater, in an impossible situation. What am I supposed to do? This is extremely embarrassing. If I publicly criticize Christianity, then, you know, um, I'm going to kind of take it on the chin. So that was, so he first explained the situation so everyone could understand it. The second thing was he says, how little do you think of me, Lafater? You think I'm so silly that I've never considered the foundations of my religion and I just accept it out of fear? He said it would be much easier for me to convert. If I converted, I would get all sorts of social privileges. You think it's easy to be a Jew who's tolerated, uh, barely tolerated and has to face anti-Semitism and that uh, wasn't the term then, but uh, hatred against Jews, and you know this this is this is not a a, a a conviction I take lightly. It's something that is a deep conviction for me that I've thought very carefully about it. And then what he did was in the third part, which was the most important thing that he did, was that he said that he talked about why he adhered to Judaism, and he said that Judaism was a religion that was didn't believe that you had to be Jewish to go to heaven. If you were an ethical person, and he cited these seven Noahide laws, if you were an ethical person, you could go to heaven. Judaism didn't seek to make converts. And this was so brilliant because he didn't have to say anything about Christianity. The he, what, what he was leaving unsaid, but that all Christians knew, was they believed that you, unless you believe in uh, Jesus' incarnation and resurrection and the Trinity, that you were going to hell. And he was saying Judaism is actually much more progressive than Christianity, and Judaism fits much better with Enlightenment principles than Christianity. And in fact, what he was saying was that Christ it's not that a Jew should convert to Christianity, it's that Christians should be making Christianity more like Judaism. And that was, again, this element of his thought where he's trying to instruct and improve society and improve the wider world. And he was not only concerned, again, just with, with the Jewish world. So the reaction to this was amazing because most Christian, most intellectuals, Christian intellectuals, Protestant intellectuals who observed this sided with Mendelssohn. And that was incredible. That they, most of them thought that Lavater was completely out of, out of, um, uh, out of line. And in fact, Lavater was kind of forced to apologize, which he kind of sort of did. But that was a very important symbol, I think, for many Jews to realize that these Christians who had all this power could see that a Jew was right. And that, um, and that a Christian was treating them unethically by, by asking them to convert, which previously had been seen that's the best thing for a Jew would be to convert. So this is actually a very important resonant um, episode in his life that I think um, illustrates some of the uh, issues that he was tackling with and, and, and his ways of showing way forward.
you want to jump in, David, or I? Um, well, let, let me push you for a minute. Um, I understand how it shows the issues that he was dealing with, those specific issues of the 1770s. But you were, in your initial um, talk, you were arguing uh, for a Mendelssohn who can show us how to respond to our issues. Um, so how are we going to translate that very particular late 18th century European situation to our, let's say, Trumpian moment? <laughs> right. So my sense of it is that Mendelssohn is providing a model for how a minority, especially a minority religion, um, finds its place in society in the context of a majority, um, of, a, of a different religious um, and cultural um, affiliation. And I think that what one finds just in this letter is already Mendelssohn is, de is defining Judaism as a religion that is in accordance with tolerance. Even though one can find many thinkers and writers who said very intolerant things, Mendelssohn's argument was this is a distortion of true Judaism. And he would always go back to certain original, especially Talmudic sources and certain authoritative commentators to, to prove this, although he was willing to disagree with someone like Maimonides on, his inter on Maimonides' interpretation of the Noahide laws, which he thought was too exclusivistic. So he believed that there was an authentic core of Judaism, and he was willing to work to, um, to establish that. And he felt that this core was something that was in accordance with um, tolerance, reason, um, and life in a, in a broader society. And secondly, and the second point is the point that I mentioned, that he felt that it wasn't only a responsibility of Jews to adjust and um, rethink their religion, or to, um, or just to kind of find their place in society, they had to work for the betterment of society as a whole. And their religion had to be important, not just for preserving Jews, but also for advancing society as a whole. And I think this is a very important lesson when we think about how minorities can adjust into majorities, that um, you know, the thinking has to be big and, and wide and a sense of, uh, a very strong, broad sense of social responsibility from the minority that that um, that extends outwards. So. Um, I just wanted to add to what Micha said that I, I, I think what Mendelssohn was really trying to do was to establish standards of civility. That toleration was clearly part of that, but civility in the sense of what subjects are really important because they're shared by everyone and which subjects can remain private and beyond that, sp that sphere of discussion. And I think what, what Mendelssohn says in that response to Lafater, as Micha points out, is that Mendelssohn understood philosophy to be about shared truths, the existence of God, the immortality of the soul, and providence. Because those three ideas for Mendelssohn and for most 18th century thinkers were the foundation of a common morality. I mean, what the Enlightenment, one way of seeing the Enlightenment is to say that what the Enlightenment was really all about was finding a common morality for a religiously plural society, right? From the time of the Reformation, Europe was religiously plural. You had now Catholics, you had Protestants, and, and the growth of innumerable Protestant sects, all of which were warring with one another, and you had Jews. And the problem for virtually every European country, Prussia was at the forefront of it, was how do you create a common foundation for a religiously plural society? And that's what the Enlightenment was all about. And what Mendelssohn how Mendelssohn understood that is that the Enlightenment as a philosophical movement should emphasize those core or foundational ideas which are necessary to all religions in order to have a common morality and a common discourse to undergird 
society. And, you know, I, I mean, the, the reality of it for Mendelssohn was is that anything he wrote, living in Prussia, that this occurred in 1769-70, he had to submit to the censor. And Mendelssohn had a personal privilege to live in Prussia because of his eminence as a philosopher. But that privilege could be revoked at any time. As a matter of fact, when Mendelssohn died, his wife and children had to leave Prussia and reapply in order to have a privilege to live there. Because the first Jews to be naturalized or have citizenship were few wealthy Jews um, who, who, who gained that privilege in 1790. Mendelssohn died in 1786. Um, well, we've barely scratched the surface, and I, I have many more questions, but I think it's actually time to open it up to you. Um, so do we have somebody with a microphone? Terrific. Um, so, right there on there. Given all that has been said about Mendelssohn, I'm curious to know what he may have said or written about two other persons. On the one hand, Spinoza, who also might be considered the first modern Jew. And on the other hand, Voltaire, who after all, for a certain period of time, lived in the court of Frederick the Great. Did uh, Mendelssohn ever come into contact with Voltaire at that time? Or uh, if he didn't come into contact, did he ever have any kind of correspondence with him or say or write something about Voltaire and Voltaire's views on religion, Jews, and toleration? Uh, so Spinoza's. We'll repeat the question. Right, so the question was, what was Spinoza? Uh, what was uh, Mendelssohn's attitude towards Spinoza? On the one hand, Spinoza, um, and on the other hand, the philosopher um, Voltaire, uh, so who was who was who was a, a radical deist and did not believe in divine providence and some of the principles that Mendelssohn believed in. So with regard to Spinoza, I actually wrote a book on this, uh, so I can answer this question, I believe. Um, he has a very complex attitude. And actually, in his first writing, the philosophical dialogues that David mentioned, um, he talks about Spinoza. And he believes that Spinoza has been unfairly maligned, and his importance has been downplayed by a hero of, of, of Mendelssohn's, who's Leibniz, who I mentioned, mentioned earlier. And because Spinoza was known as a heretic, not just in the Jewish community, but also in the broader um, you know, Christian world, uh, people, it was, he was kind of someone you didn't want to be associated with. And what Mendelssohn, uh, what Mendelssohn argued was that actually Leibniz had derived many of his important ideas from Spinoza. Uh, he had taken them further, but he had derived them from Spinoza. So Spinoza actually serves as a figure um, who's a kind of model for, Spino for, for Mendelssohn, um, in a certain sense, because he's someone who's contributed to modern European culture and the development of philosophy. And he shows that a Jew is capable of, of this. And his friend, Mendelssohn's friends Lessing, said that um, Mendelssohn sought to be a second Spinoza, but without Spinoza's errors, without the errors of Spinoza, because he obviously could not accept many of Spinoza's principles. But later in life, um, his attitude really, um, he's forced into a different position, and that's because this friend Lessing of his was accused of being a Spinozist. And what that meant in, in the 18th century was someone who um, denied, the, denied God and essentially denied morality. And it was basically kind of being a sociopath, the equivalent of a sociopath. So, um, so here, um, Mendelssohn adopts a different view where on the one hand he criticizes um, Spinoza's views, but on the other hand, he claims you know there's a way of interpreting um, Spinoza where he is really fits with morality and religion, and he says that's probably what Lessing believed in. 
Um, that was Lessing's cynicism. Because L Lessing had told this mutual friend of theirs, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, near the end of his life, that he was a spinozist. And so this was a kind of very, it was a huge scandal of the day. Uh, and Mendelssohn had to kind of step up. So there's a lot more, but that's very, very basic. Um, uh, the other part of the question was, did Mendelssohn know Voltaire, who had spent time in Berlin at the Prussian court? Um, I might be wrong about this, but as far as I know, Mendelssohn never had any contact with Voltaire. But the very fact that he didn't is significant, and it says something about the culture of Berlin in the 18th century, which is the following. There was a tremendous divide between the culture of Frederick the Great's court and of the city of Berlin. Frederick the Great wrote in French and surrounded himself with French intellectuals. And the French intellectuals at his court made it their business to try and call into question and undermine contemporary German philosophy. In contrast, Mendelssohn and his friends in Berlin, the intellectuals in Berlin, were advocates and defenders of German philosophy. As a matter of fact, Mendelssohn felt that German philosophy, in contrast to French philosophy, was believing philosophy, that it was philosophy conducive to religious believers. Um, what's also interesting is, is that because of his eminence, Mendelssohn was actually elected to the Berlin Academy of Sciences. But Frederick the Great exercised a pocket veto. He stuck the vote, the letter appointing Mendelssohn in his pocket, and it went no further. Because it would have made a tremendous difference in Mendelssohn's life. Mendelssohn supported himself by working in a silk factory, as I mentioned, first as a bookkeeper, then as a manager, then as co-owner. So Mendelssohn would divide his day. He would get up at 5 in the morning and write until 9. Then he would go and work at the silk factory. Then he would come home in the evening, in the late afternoon, and hold, hold an open salon, and then say his prayers and go to bed early. If he had been elected to the Berlin Royal Academy, he would have been freed from working at the silk factory. He would have had a stipend that he could have lived on and been a full-time philosopher. So as far as I know, there was absolutely no contact but it was because of this tension in Berlin. And let me just add one more point to it. What's important to realize is that Berlin was a kind of court and garrison boom town in the 18th century. It was full of soldiers and it was full of Frederick's court. But it still lacked many of the institutions of a major city. Berlin didn't have a university. It had a medical college but it didn't have a university. When Mendelssohn was beginning to learn philosophy on his own, one of his friends took him to a lecture on philosophy in Latin at a local high school. But that's because there was no university. The, the university wasn't, University of Berlin, which of course became one of the great German universities, wasn't founded until 1809 during the reform era. One just small note on the Voltaire that um, you know Voltaire was very opposed to Leibniz's philosophy, right? And he Leibniz had famously claimed that this was the best of all possible worlds. And Voltaire's most famous work, Candide, tries to show in vivid detail all these horrible things that happened to to Candide, uh, to kind of make a mockery of it. And Mendelssohn thought that actually um, German philosophy was much more profound than French philosophy. He thought French philosophy was very superficial. And he felt that Voltaire kind of cooked the books and kind of, you know, by presenting this absurd series of, 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 of events uh, to prove that, that this was not the best of all possible worlds. And I believe it was Lessing who wanted to actually write a sequel to uh, Voltaire's book called Anti-Candide, where everything turned out for the best in the end. <laughs> he didn't get around to it, but that was the, the idea. I have a question uh, for the panel. 
Um, it was very enjoyable, by the way, and thank you. Um, my take on the, on the talks were that, um, was that the panelists here all assume, as many scholars do, Mendelssohn's adoption of a secular Enlightenment humanism uh, to which he adapts a traditionalist Judaism. Um, I would like to question uh, all three of you um, and anyone else who, <laughs> um, to somehow question this narrative a little bit and just want to raise three points and perhaps you can enlighten me. Um, number one, um, his definition of religion in Jerusalem as a collective edification, uh, which I understand uh, as Erbaum, which uh, Professor Sorkin has written on extensively, which I see as sort of a type of incarnational ethos, which sort of forms the backbone of, of Bildung in the 18th century, and also the notion of pure spirit and heart. Uh, these notions this is, that... This is getting a, a little complicated. I'm, I'm taking notes, but I'm, I'm not sh sure we're all going to be able to follow this. Can you narrow it down sure. to something with sure. the, that's got a question sure. mark at the end Sure, of question it? mark would be, um, the three points would be um, sort of... Um, privileging of religious experience of the divine um, <clears throat> as a stimulus to morality or some common morality rather than law, and his aversion to word and script. And number three, uh, what do you feel about Mendelssohn's except, um, <clears throat> um, works on reason or what Kassira would call right reason or uh, Shaftesbarian uh, Cambridge Platonism? How does this uh, dovetail uh, how does this support uh, Mendelssohn's adoption of a secular Enlightenment humanism when we see the shades of rather Protestant thought uh, without the garb of dogma? Uh, well, I, I, I'll take a stab at it. Okay, the, the, the question is... Um, I'm working on it for many years, it's okay. <laughs> um, the question is how, how are we to understand Mendelssohn's grappling with reason and the kind of reason that he adopts? Is that a fair... Okay, what, okay. Um, look, I, 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 I think that um, um, I, I think that one of the problems at the, bo at, at the base of your question is you assume that the Enlightenment is secular and therefore in tension with religion, whether Judaism or Protestantism. Uh, I think that that, that, that is a um, fundamentally flawed notion of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment was compatible with religion from the start. You mentioned the Cambridge Platonists. The Cambridge Platonists were an outstanding example of the way in which reason and belief could be reconciled. Mendelssohn was fully aware of the various traditions of what I would call religious enlightenment in the 17th and 18th century. If you look at his library, you know, there, there, there is a catalog of his library when he, when he died. Uh, it's full of the works of different uh, proponents of religious enlightenment, beginning with Cudsworth and the, and the Cambridge Platonists, all the way through the theological Wolfians like Baumgarten, on to the neologues like Jerusalem and Spalding. Uh, Mendelssohn's library also contained, and he was a master uh, of not just natural law theory, but ecclesiastical natural law theory. Okay, no. Okay, Micha, do you want to? My question was exactly opposite. I argue that Mendelssohn was very aware of these Christian notions. This is. This is. This is. Yeah, this sounds maybe we should take this, this up after, after so the after the subtle that that we this sounds so subtle we should do it with cheese and wine in a few minutes. Go ahead. I I think the the comparison with Spinoza is interesting in in another way. I mean, growing up in the Haredi in the Haredi community today, and I'm curious how far back this goes. Mendelssohn was basically considered the Antichrist, and Spinoza was this uh, kind of confused individual. And interestingly, I saw an article about 20 years ago in the Jewish Observer, which was this kind of thoughtful Haredi newspaper questioning why, what was so bad about Mendelssohn because he believed in God and believed in the Torah. And interestingly, they said the problem isn't God and the Torah, it's the rabbis that he didn't have enough respect for, which is fascinating in its own way. But from your perspective, what is it about 
Mendelssohn that's so problematic in the Haredi community? And did that start with the Qasam Sofer? Did that start in the 20th century? Some of the opposition to him, or was that much earlier? Okay, the, the question is, um, why did Mendelssohn have such a negative image in the Haredi or ultra-Orthodox community? Because that image, that pro image goes all the way back um, into the 1780s. Uh, it, it, it's possible that it begins with his Bible translation. Um, it's also possible that it starts later. The Khatam Sofer, who was one of the founders of ultra-Orthodoxy um, in, in the Habsburg Empire, um, is, is one of his famous slogans is, do not touch the works of Moses Mendelssohn, Al-Tiga Bekitve Ramad. As a matter of fact, it, it, some of it, some Scholars and members of his family have said that that actually isn't what he said, but that that's been misconstrued. Um, you know, I, 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 um, I, I think a lot of the negative image of Mendelssohn in the ultra-Orthodox community actually has very little to do with Mendelssohn and has to do with the larger controversy over the movement to which he belonged, the Haskalah. Yeah. And that, you know, it's Naftali Hertz Wesley in his response to Joseph II's Edict of Toleration in 1781-1782, who writes a tract, uh, Words of Peace and Truth, Divrei Shalom Ve'emet, advocating the adoption of secular education, who did insult the rabbis, right? And then he regretted that and retracted that. Mendelssohn didn't do that, but Mendelssohn was then associated with Wesley, right? If you read earlier histories uh, of Mendelssohn from the 19th century, they'll say Mendelssohn's books were, his Bible was burnt by, by ultra-Orthodox Jews. It's not true. You know, the, Mendelssohn's Bible was actually used by ultra-Orthodox rabbis as a study Bible. So the, 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 the history is much more complicated and detailed um, and, uh, than, than we usually think of. And let me just add one thing to that, which I think there needs to be an exhaustive study of this. And as David says, there's certainly many uh, Orthodox rabbis who spoke very approvingly of, of Mendelssohn and someone like Rabbi Akiva Eger was a subscriber to the Beuer. But, um, there's a, but there, I think that one element, I think David is absolutely correct, and this needs to be established more firmly, that I think it ha the opposition to Mendelssohn, I believe much of it in the Haredi world, has to do with the debates over Haskalah, uh, especially in Eastern Europe. And what the Maskilim did was they made Mendelssohn into the Rebbe. They made him the source of all their ideas, even when they were deviating from him. And if, on the one hand, he was supposed to be the equivalent of some kind of orthodox rebbe or Hasidic rebbe, then if you were opposed to the Maskilim, then he must be the Antichrist. So I think that that is an important part of the story, but I think it's much more complicated. Um, so. I think um, I have an idea. Let me, let me try this out. Um, as an editor, I. Uh, I really appreciate Mendelssohn as, as a writer. I, I wish I had a Mendelssohn who I could give half the issue to every, every issue. Um, so I, but, but also, um, I think it would be appropriate to end on a characteristic note of Mendelssohn's. So, um, so here's the, the last few lines of the great book, Jerusalem, uh, as translated by, by our colleague, Alan Arkish. Um, and then we'll adjourn and, and talk Mendelssohnian things over wine and cheese. So, let everyone per be permitted to speak as he thinks, to invoke God after his own manner or that of his fathers, and to seek eternal salvation where he thinks he may find it, as long as he does not disturb public felicity and acts honestly toward the civil laws,
toward you and his fellow citizens. Let no one in your states be a searcher of hearts and a judge of thoughts. Let no one assume a right that the omniscient has reserved to himself alone. If we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, then do yourselves render unto God what is God's. Love truth, love peace.